Uh, hello and uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to a first of three webinars on the agribusiness uh, industry. Uh, this series of webinars is organized by the School of Business Executive Education in partnership with Lagos Business School and, in, uh, and with the collaboration of the American Chamber of Commerce and the Federation of Egyptian uh, Industry. Uh, and let me start first by saying that um, agriculture is crucial to the Egyptian economy and it accounts for 14.5% of the country's GDP and 12% of all exports. It also employs approximately 30% of the total active uh, population. Egypt's Vision 2030 ag addresses the agricultural sector, which in turn has the potential to employ thousands of youth. However, countries with farming industries face consistent pressures from global competition. Remaining competitive requires agribusinesses to operate more efficiently, which can require investments in new technologies, new ways of fertilizing and watering crops, and new ways of connecting to the global market. Also, investing in the skills and the capabilities of the workforce is the key factor that could lead to the more efficient operations of the sector. I would like you to welcome with me tonight uh, three uh, of our distinguished speakers on uh, the topic of agribusiness. And we're going to start with our first speaker. Uh, let me introduce him first. Professor Adil Biltegi, uh, who is currently the chair of the International Drylands Development Commission. He is prof he's a professor of Arid Land Agriculture Graduate Studies and Research Institute in Ain Shams University. He's also the chair of the Food and Agriculture Research Council at the Egyptian Academy of Science and the chair of the Agriculture Committee of Supreme Council of Universities. Uh, Dr. Aydel is going to speak to us tonight about the agricultural sector and the ecosystem and the challenges that are facing the agricultural sector in, in general. Dr. Aydel, uh, please, uh, you can start. It's okay. Uh, let me also, after Dr. Adil uh, shares his screen, let me remind everyone that uh, you can share your questions in uh, the chat box and we're going to collect all the questions and at the end we're going to open the floor for discussions and for Q&A. Dear colleagues, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to talk uh, to you today uh, about a very important topic uh, which relate to agribusiness and uh, relate to the livelihood of a lot of people around the world. And uh, we will navigate through this presentation through scales. I, I, the title I selected is Navigating Through Uncertainty, the Future of Agribusiness. Uh, let us see what is the boundaries, where we are now. We are in this planet, we are exposed to climate change. And um, in Paris Agreement, we said that we will put all measurements not to exceed one and a half to two centigrade uh, increase. Um, but what's happening is that we go business as usual. It will be between four to five centigrade. And the current commitment does not, uh, it will take us to 2.7 to 3.7. Uh, and therefore, this is a, a publication by the world bank and saying why a four centigrade warmer world must be avoided. And um, the issue here is that we will have a melting of ice caps as well as expanding of the water in the oceans. Um, uh, and this expansion will cause sea level rise, which could be uh, really detrimental. Uh, in this case here, just to as of this, if uh, uh, today, uh, since the industrial uh, time where the, they start calculating this, we have an increase of 20 centimeter, but expected by 2050 that we can go uh, beyond uh, 60 centimeter. And this is a static water. If we uh, continue until 2100, as you can see, that we, we could really move the high range between one meter uh, to two meters. And this is with the waves and so on, it's really higher than this. This put a lot of pressure and we will come to this um, 
later. But if we look in parallel about who inhabits this planet where the climate change is impacting, we are now nearly 7.8 billion. Uh, in 2050, we, we will reach 10 billion. In 2100, it's between 11 to 17 billion. More than 70% of the world population grows between uh, 2000, uh, 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 2010 and 2050 will occur in 24 of the world's poorest countries. And therefore, if, if I will give you an idea, um, maybe my, our colleagues from Nigeria will mention this, but Nigeria now is 207 uh, million people, but in 2050, there will be 400. Egypt now is 102. In 2050, it will be 167. But what we are sharing together that agriculture and agriculture-related activities in both countries, in Nigeria, 70% of the population depend on their livelihood on, on agriculture and agriculture-related activities. And this means agro-industry, transport, all packing, cooling, uh, all, all the, 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 the food chain uh, included. Uh, in Egypt, it's about 50% of the population. 70% uh, is only people who work on the farms. But if you include all the people who are dealing with agriculture-related activity, it will come to 50%. Uh, and this, the majority of them um, uh, are really, they need support and they are marginalized. Then by 2050, we will hit the 10 billion uh, mark and we need to increase our food production by 70%. But unfortunately, with the increase of temperature, we will lose, we will lose about 50% of our production globally. It depends on where you are. It depends on the agroecology, <coughs> as well as it depends on the crop. But maybe we will lose about 50%, which is highly needed. Therefore, uh, this crops is, is uh, this the, uh, decrease in production is very hazardous. Uh, this this um, uh, slide shows uh, some details on the cereal uh, output, which is decrease of minus 50 from 5 to 50 percent, depending where we are. As I mentioned, we need 70 percent more food. How we can do this equation? Uh, while climate change is going to reduce uh, between 20 to 50 percent of the total production, global production of food, and we need more 70 percent. How we are going to arrive to this? I, this is superimposed on this is the losses, and this is post-harvest losses, which which is between 45 to 20 percent. It depends on the uh, food from root to vegetables to uh, pulses to dairy to meat to, to fish as well. The impact as well of climate change will affect aquaculture, inland aquaculture and marine aquaculture. It will affect as well the transmission of disease uh, between animals. There is no borders. I mean, the so-called fence of Mr. Trump or anybody else will never stop this because this is going to happen, the transmission of flies and transmission of, a, uh, uh, of, of this disease will happen over the border and trans-border disease transmission is going to happen with the increase of temperature. And that's why we need to look at this and to see what is our readiness to, to face this issue. And the infectious uh, diseases, as I said, especially in hyper-arid and arid zones is going to be uh, very clear. And there is indications of this, which is already happening and the, the, there was a detailed study in 2019 about this issue. Meanwhile, when we look at the map of Africa and how it moves from hyper-arid to arid to, uh, to savanna to the, the different agroecology, the different zones, it's very important for us to understand this because we need to, need to make an assessment according to where is this boundaries of the agroecology is. And what's happening, this boundary is not fixed. This boundary is going to shift and is going to change. If I just move on to other water, 
to other natural resources, which is water. Water by year 2025, um, will, we, the, the scarcity will increase. And as you can see from this map, this red here is a very acute water poverty, which is less than 1,000 uh, cubic meter of water per person per year. Jordan, for instance, is 125 uh, uh, cubic meter per year, which is very, I mean, this is acute water poverty. But if you look at the states, the states is about 17,000 per person per year. The world average is 7,000. And, and therefore, anything under 1,000 cubic meter of water per year is water poverty. And we have to link water to energy and to food because they are interlinked. And then um, the social, uh, socioeconomical upheaval, the, the shortage of food supply, uh, all these disruptions uh, could happen and could affect the geopolitics uh, of resources or resources diplomacy, which we need to be careful when we look at that. With the financial crisis which happened, uh, we, we had this, everybody has produced this diagram where financial and economical stability is totally linked to food security and linked to political security. Then food crisis and financial crisis are really, the two are totally interlinked. And this is, let alone, this is normal, but if you have um, an epidemic and you have climate change both together, therefore then you have to be very careful. Um, the whole world, if you map, can we cope with this, uh, with this uh, situation? There is lack of coping capacity uh, in a lot of countries in the world, and you can see the red and the different degrees of it. Um, and, and, and therefore, we need to increase the coping capacity. We need to increase the adaptive capacity and to enrich the people with, with knowledge and awareness, as well as policy, institutions, legislation, to try to cope with this uh, threat which is coming to them. Then adaptive capacity and coping capacity are both on the same time. In 2015, everybody who is interested in global uh, agriculture, not only global agriculture and the future of human beings on this planet Earth, we were happy to have the MDGs, uh, the 17 goal, as well as the SDG and the Sunday framework uh, for risk aversion and risk management and the Paris Agreement. All of them came in 2015, but they are lacking only a commitment in writing. They lack the political will. And therefore we, we, we can very easily link the targets of the disaster risk reduction we can link it with the 17 sustainable goal. At least 10 of the 17 goals are firmly linked and with, with, uh, with uh, global, uh, global uh, goals, uh, which we are all aiming at. Therefore, what we are facing? We are facing a very dangerous tsunami. I presented this, this slide in, uh, in a meeting in Copenhagen whereby we met to see, can we build up an adaptive capacity fund for the poor countries, for the developing countries. And therefore this picture will show you that this tsunami, this miserable boy, he is all of us. And we need to see how we can avoid this. And therefore one, one option of this is to have new tools of science and technology. Uh, all what I'm putting here is part of it, remote sensing, uh, biotechnology, genetic engineering, simulation models, information technology, expert system, artificial intelligence, renewable energy, solar, wind, and biofuel, new uh, energy saving techniques for desalination of water uh, uh, and water transportation and nanotechnology with all it has like biofertilizers, uh, biopesticides, all, all the other aspects. Therefore, we need to go to science. We need knowledge to be added to the equation. Then to go through this, we have two routes, either adaptation or mitigation. Mitigation will take a long time 
because you have to decrease all these gases. It will take very long, long time to happen. Adaptation is what, what is really uh, uh, the dimension which is beneficial for the developing countries. Therefore, we need new genetic makeups and uh, we, we need to have this through uh, breeding programs and we need uh, new agro-management techniques as well as massive program for human resource development capacity with knowledge uh, overarching all this. Then this is the adaptation uh, in details and I don't think the uh, a slide will be there, but uh, enhancing uh, uh, the, the functional breeding development of biotic and abiotic resistance. This is plants which will tolerate high temperature and, and others. The agro-management techniques is optimization use of nutrition, moist sensors, simulation modeling, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, internet of things, all these aspects will be there. But if we have the genetic resources, the genetic resources by the environment, by people will give you the yield. And this is alphabetical. I mean, the whole world, I was member in the board of the Global um, Biodiversity Fund and we, with the Nordic uh, Gene Bank, uh, they built uh, the Svalbard Gene Bank uh, in Svalbard. And this is in, uh, in glacial ice um, in, in this. And, and it, it stores about 6 million uh, seeds. These seeds could be taken and uh, you can put it in a breeding program and you can have wheat, which will have drought tolerance. You can produce um, maize as well, which is drought tolerant, and but with the new techniques with CRISPR, um, uh, uh, you can even make genome editing very quickly. With the water issue, uh, as I mentioned before, this is a situation, but we need to optimize water use by using hydroponics here, vertical agriculture, and greenhouses, and we use only thin layer of nutrient produce fodder even, as well as changing all the irrigation system. We have proposed in the agriculture of 2030, we have proposed uh, an on-farm irrigation system in Egypt, which will save at least 10 billion cubic meter of water and save about 20% of the land to be uh, planted, as well as increase productivity. Water harvesting as well, we are working on this. This is water harvesting in Palestine where an international center was dealing with them. In Egypt, we had four uh, agricultural strategies. Um, this one here was in the 90s with the World Bank, the one which we had and is being renewed. It has a business plan as well as it is being developed in, in 2010. And the vision here is to achieve comprehensive economical and social development based on dynamic agricultural sector capable um, uh, of rapid growth while paying special attention to the underprivileged social groups and reducing rural poverty. This, this, um, this uh, strategy called for a dynamic uh, move, not a static. You need to assess where you are all the time. Then the future of agriculture in Egypt has to be knowledge intensive, aiming at high level of bioeconomy. By, by, I mean, saying this, you have to optimize the use of water. You have to maximize the use of ICTKM and all your operations. You have to increase your exportation as well as increase production of the crops. You focus on crops which will take this water, like the figs here, like olive oils, like date, uh, date uh, palm, as well as uh, pomegranate and others, as well as medical plants and uh, and uh, other, other aspects as well. We used a lot of, uh, of course, in this uh, strategy, we had, uh, we had legislations, which is already at least uh, 14. One of them was suggested, nine is out. We used as well a virtual extension um, and communication system called Vercon. And this was to enhance and modernize the uh, extension service and to arrive to a bigger community of farmers, as well as we had this com develop a communication network uh, called RATCON. And this has been taken after it's been developed in Egypt, it's been taken uh, by FAO 
and it is used now everywhere. Um, the expert system lab as well has done a lot in Egypt, which is based on AI. Uh, actually, Professor Rafa from the uh, uh, from AUC has participated. He is a founder of this lab in agriculture in Egypt. Using smart agriculture, using uh, precision agriculture, is very important. And uh, because you need to combine water management by soil monitoring as well as uh, this new scope of synthetic biology. You can have ice cream without any milk. But let me jump, this is the avenues of science. Let me go back to aquaculture. Aquaculture is very important. We need to improve uh, our fishing uh, vessels and facilities in the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. And we have done this as well as uh, we, we, are, we are in the process of building up these facilities uh, for the marine. Meanwhile, there is a lot of program like the Salasil, which was um, basically was a program whereby you bring all the farmers together and you can put them with cooperatives, you link them to the market outside of Egypt and in Egypt, and they make the exports, their products, it improves their livelihood. Meanwhile, I would like to mention the issue of algae. We need to look at algae as well and how to link this with uh, uh, issues of the solar energy and the other, other aspects. Back to the agroecology and why we need to assess all the time the agroecology around us, the impact of climate change. Uh, the assessment report uh, five has called for a, a much more thorough uh, examination of the losses and to see what is the key issues which is happening, which increase the vulnerability of the people in the climate hotspots. Impact in Africa is enormous. Uh, we have 350 million to 600 million people are experienced increased in water stress uh, in the continent. The uh, continent will be about 3.4 billion by year 2050. We need as well to look at safety nets here. An example, uh, this is 2020 October. Uh, the USDA is having a system uh, for price uh, loss coverage as well as for insurance for the farmers in the states um, to help them. Therefore, this is a cycle of the drivers uh, of the change in agriculture. I just go fast here. Then we need to assess climate uh, affected decision and overall goals. We need to look at um, the adaptation options. We need to uh, select preferred options, as well as we need to look at this decision cycle as a whole with potential of how this can affect the livelihood of people. We need to focus on the, on the policies, legislation, water resources, land resources, the most important element is human resources. Um, the next summit was, uh, was last uh, month and, and this summit is part of the effort, global effort to combine the awareness or, or try to raise the awareness of the impact of climate change and asking the people in industry uh, how they can participate effectively, um, the banks, uh, international banks as well as local banks. And um, if we look at uh, the, the past, uh, this Mr. Obama say, I could have stopped catastrophic climate change 20 years ago in Copenhagen. We said Copenhagen is hope in Hagen, but there was no hope. We have gone to Cancun and we said in Cancun, yes, we can, we didn't. But the Japanese has done this Sunday, Sunday framework, which is a wonderful piece of legislation or, and, and, and regulations. And here is the emperor and his wife uh, before he left. He, he is with his top politicians. People like Abdul, uh, Abdul Salam, uh, Abdul Kalam uh, from uh, the president of India. He supported science. Uh, Professor Bolog, uh, Nobel Prize winner in, in, in agriculture, the only one uh, has really supported this effort. In Egypt, we are doing the sustainability issue for more than 5,000 years based on the stability in water supply. 
The resilience of knowledge for mankind is what we need. We need to bridge the gap between the have and have not. We need to look at peace and stability and prosperity with different perspectives. We need to look at developing countries and the advanced o OECD countries and to bridge the gap of lack of knowledge uh, for the sake of humanity in the future. We need to work together. We need to have a shift of consciousness on the part of the have and the have not and a new understanding of the oneness of humanity. I do thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aydel, for the, for the very thorough coverage of uh, the agricultural sector and the threats that are, that's, that are facing the agricultural sector. Uh, honestly, lots of very interesting questions coming in the, in the chat box, but we're going to wait for them until we hear the other speakers too. And actually, let me take one statement of yours and, and link it to uh, the next speaker, uh, where you actually mentioned that we really need to focus on policies and focus you, on human me. resources. Sorry, you can't, you can't hear me? So, no, no, uh, again, no, I'm going to take this statement. You. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, where you said we need to focus on policies and human I, I resources. I lost you again. And actually, on that, uh, I want to invite our second speaker today, Mr. Ezi. Um, Mr. Ezi is a, a seasoned banker with a vast experience across agriculture financing, corporate banking, yeah, commercial yeah. banking, retail banking, and banking operations. He has hands-on uh, experience and has been at the fore in the implementation of various government-led agricultural initiatives in Nigeria. So, uh, Mr. Izzy uh, is going to bring to us the, the other side of uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria and the initiatives and the policies for the financing of the agricultural system. Uh, Mr. Izzy, please, you can start your presentation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Yes, we okay. can hear you. Uh, I must apologize. I'm on the road, actually. I had to park by the road for this presentation. The issues down here in Nigeria have made it uh, difficult for me to be properly dressed too. But I will go ahead with my presentation if you can put it on the board, on the screen, please. I'm going to talk about the government intervention in funding agriculture. You know that the preponderance of agriculture we do is a smallholder farmer structure where you have, where uh, access to finance is a major issue. And the banks have been, uh, the banks have been very wary to fund agriculture in Nigeria. As it is today, the total lending to the agricultural uh, sector by the commercial banks in Nigeria is our project is just close to a little bit above four percent of uh, almost fifteen trillion balance sheet commercial lending to agriculture to agriculture. I've been lending only about four percent. It's uh, attributable to the agricultural sector, and that caused a major concern for the Central Bank of Nigeria. Nigeria's population is growing at a very fast rate, and like Prof said. There is uh, the high incidence of uh, the high population requires that will grow food that gives high yield to contain the population with dwindling resources as it is today. So most of the reasons why banks have found it difficult to finance agriculture yeah. revolve, revolve around uh, the, what you see on the screen, broken agricultural value chain, poor understanding of the sector, the perceived high risk, the complex credit uh, assessment processes, the high transaction costs, and the poor visibility and control of cash. Now, NISA, when NISA was set up, NISA was set up on five pillars. You can move to the next screen. NISA was set up on five pillars. And those five pillars, okay, NISA was created. This was the mandate that NISA was given to redefine, to measure, and price and then to also fix the broken agricultural value chains, and then to institutionalize incentives and agricultural lending. 
and also to stimulate the flow of finance and investment. So one of the, please, next screen. The, I want to go to the, I want to go to the pillars, the, to the pillars of uh, that set up NISA, the pillars on which NISA stands. There are five pillars on which NISA stands. Okay. Yes. Okay. So these are the five pillars. NISA is actually capitalized to the tune of $500 million to be able to act as a guarantee agency and a risk, uh, a credit risk guarantee agency to support banks to lend to agriculture. And NISA stands on five strategic pillars. And these pillars are the risk sharing pillar, which is strengthened with a $300 million fund, the insurance pillar, which is strengthened with a $30 million fund, the technical assistance pillar, which is strengthened with, I think it's a $50 million fund, the rating pillar with 10 million, and then the incentive mechanism with $100 million. The reason for this was to make sure that banks find it attractive enough to lend to agriculture because of our, not just because of our growing population, but because the bulk, Nigeria's GDP, agriculture contributes about 25% of Nigeria's GDP. And this 25% is contributed by the smallholder farmers. We have about 84 million hectares of arable land, of which only about 39, 40 million approximately is under cultivation. And this is suboptimal cultivation, the kind of cultivation that does not give the yields that are expected. Uh, Prof gave an instance of uh, width yielding 6.5 metric tons in Egypt. The last width uh, endeavor that we did, we got about 1.5 metric tons because of the cultural practices that were used. So part of the things that NISAL is supposed to do is to improve uh, general agricultural practices, train farmers and bring them up to speed on modern methods, catalyze the flow of finance into the various areas that should drive industrial production of crops. These are some of the results that NISAL has so far, but these results, I believe we can still do far better than this and we have all the enablement in the coming years to do better than what you have seen presented. Uh, one genuine and one germane uh, and enhancement which we have brought in. Uh, let, let's go to the 11th slide, please. Yes. Okay, so these are the principles that NISAL applies when we are de-risking transactions. And when you're de-risking transactions and funding transactions, a few things, those transactions must abide by these four uh, ideals. There must be bucket driven, there must be commodity focused by ecological advantage. There must be inclusion of smallholder farmers, and then it must be an integration of value chain. All of this layered with our robust risking structure allows banks now to fund. When you look at the results that we have realized so far, the results that were posted, you will see that the effect of this has driven acceptance of funding, banks accepting funding to the agricultural sector. And we have been able to break down our value chains in Nigeria into four distinct uh, segments. We have the pre-upstream that deals with the things you do before production. You have the upstream, the midstream, and the downstream. And the reason for this, I must explain, I must be honest here. You know, in the oil sector, in the oil and gas industry, you have the pre-upstream, you have the upstream, midstream, and downstream. Now, this is this made it easier for banks to accept funding of agriculture along these categorizations. And for each of these sectors, we're able to break down the activities that go into this. And our facilitation, our agriculture, our, fi our finance facilitation uses the blended finance approach where we we'll use private funds, we use technical assistance, we we'll use the proof of concept, credit guarantee, 
and market incentives to drive funding of the smallholder farmers to achieve uh, the results. And then we'll layer it with our robust uh, risk management uh, tools. Currently, like you are aware, the smallholder farmers have just very small land holdings, which makes it difficult for any bank to finance. So what we have done is to form what we call the agro -geo cooperatives. The agro -geo cooperatives have been formed in Nigeria and we're encouraging formation of more agro -geo cooperatives so that we can have contiguous land, farmers on contiguous lands so that industry, I mean, uh, mechanization can be applied and yields can be improved and also irrigation in areas where you have water shortages. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. So these are, uh, okay, these uh, this speaks to the dynamics that we use, we we'll call it the mapping to market. So at every point in time, production is only encouraged when there is a market for the, uh, commodities that have been produced. We'll, 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 NISAL is a link, form, NISAL as a link forms a bridge between the processors and the producers and would indent from the processors and transmit it backwards to the producers to engineer what they're going to produce for that year. As it is today, most of the commodities are divided either in the, are sold either in the uh, domestic market, in the industrial market, or in the export market. And in the domestic market, for those who are processing and those are in the industrial market, the major, the bulk of what they process in Nigeria revolves around the cereals. You have the maize, you have the soya bean, and then those that process rice. And this is the bulk of where, where Nigeria's uh, imports lie on. So the essence is to try to reduce the bulk, you know, try to reduce, uh, to do an import substitution where the bulk of what is imported is produced locally. And then we also use technology to map the agro areas, the areas that have the advantages for these productions. So for maize, we have specific areas in Nigeria that are situated and best suited for maize production. For cassava, we have the, we have also identified and mapped the areas that are best suited. So financing for any production is targeted at areas where there's comparative advantage and where such commodities can be produced in large quantities where nature has naturally endowed such to be produced. Like wheat, for instance, we have between the, the Lake Chad area, between the Lake Chad axis, the Kano State, Borno, coming into Jigawa State as the major area. Sorry, I'm using states in Nigeria. A lot of you might not understand, but that's, that's how we are categorized in Nigeria, according to states. We can go down further. Let me, let me try, I know I have uh, 20 minutes. Okay. So these are, these, is, these are the things that we've identified as business opportunities for banks to finance in the different segments of the value chain. So in the pre-op stream, you can see input financing, fertilizer financing, mechanization, all that comes under the pre-op stream. When we go to the upstream, that is where the rubber meets uh, the ground, where production takes place. We have the agro geo cooperatives, like I said, that have tried to bring farmers together, give them a financial identity, give them a land ID, because we use the latitude and longitude location of their land to create a vast ID for them. And with this vast ID, you can actually, on the true Google, you can actually locate farmlands where they are. And we have the bank, uh, the BVN numbers for banks that identifies individuals because it is specific for an individual. That gives a financial identity to that individual. It's no longer the case of funding an unknown farmer in one remote area. Rather, you can identify this farmer with his banking details, with his land location, lot long land locations to identify where this farmer is located. And you can also, with the vast ID, verify what, uh, what quantity of land, the hectare that the farmer is farming on. 
the agro cooperative uh, uh, method that I talked about speaks to contiguity, bringing farmers using such uh, banking terminologies like know your customer, know your neighbor, and know your know your farm to identify farmers and bring them together in one contiguous block. We don't encourage them to buy tractors because it's an expensive equipment for the smallholder farmers to own. But this creates a captive market for investors who are willing to invest in agriculture to bring in equipment mechanization on a fee for service model. So you can see that when you lock a land area, say a state or some national government brings out about 20,000 hectares that is partitioned into two hectare or five hectare lots and you lock it down and investor can come in and provide all the necessary mechanization and all the necessary irrigation that will allow cropping to happen on that 20,000 contiguous hectare of land continuously over a period of time and the investor can recoup his money. So we have the midstream method, we have the midstream sector where we have uh, the embedded modular processing geo cooperative. What we also encourage is to reduce haulage from one remote area down to an industrial area, back to, another, to the same area to sell those goods. Let primary processing happen in those, uh, happen in those areas. And then what comes out is uh, semi-finished uh, goods for efficiency and for value. We can go further down, please. Yeah, you can there. Okay. So like I said, like I said, under the geo cooperative model, we've been able to aggregate farmers. Currently, we, we started this model this year, but the COVID-19 uh, pandemic also affected our operations. But we've tried to use technology and remotely reach these uh, farmers where they are because we have field offices in all the sub, in all the states of the federation, including the federal capital territory, we've been able to reach farmers and tried as much as possible to create uh, up over a thousand geo cooperatives as of today, and with land holdings in excess of a hundred and fifty thousand hectares contiguous land, and we also have investors that have come in that want to provide mechanization for these lands, investors that want to provide irrigation for this land, and investors that want to offtake the produce from this land. And part of this is also uh, aimed at catalyzing the commodity market in Nigeria. As it is today, we don't, we don't have an active commodity market. It's just being built up. But we must be able to produce commodities that will fit into the commodity market. So the geo cooperative model allows us to target production of various commodities in the areas where they have the ecological uh, advantage to feed into the uh, commodity market based on the indents that uh, processors have given us. We can go further down. We can go further down this slide. Okay. Okay, go further down. This is the same, is the same explanation. Okay, so like, like this slide here, what this slide tells us, what, what this is talking about here. Yeah, hold on, go back to the first one, please. Go back to the previous, to the previous one. Yes. Okay. So this speaks about the joke crop, the approach we, we use in uh, forming the geo cooperative. Like I said, the primary function of NISAL is to catalyze finance to uh, agriculture. And we know that you can't do agriculture comfortably without carrying the smallholder farmer along. You're not going to throw them away from their land and acquire the land and give to big industrial users. Rather, we'll try to bring them together as a block, let them produce what the ecology of the area allows them to produce what they have advantage to produce and what they will achieve optimal yield. And we'll have minimum of 10 hectare cells that we're using because of the areas of, because in certain parts of Nigeria, 
we don't have as much land. That's why we are using, that's why we're using the 10 hectare cells as a minimum standard. We can go for we'll go further down. Further down. Okay. So here tells you, here tells you, sorry, no, the one before this. The one before this. So here tells you, if you look at the target, what NISAL is targeting is to have 4 million hectares structured. On those 4 million hectares, we are going to affect about 8 million farmers in 16,000 geo cooperatives. That's what the target is. That's what we're working towards. And the funding for this, which we will require to make sure that this happens, is actually in billions of Naira. The, the fact that you have a structure that can produce results. A lot of the commercial banks in Nigeria have become very interested in funding because we have promised them or we have structured it in such a way that there will be one loop where everybody will be captured. Those that are doing primary production will be captured. The investor that is being funded for mechanization is captured. The processor is captured and the exporter for export produce is captured in one loop within a bank. Traceability of money is very important for banks for them to be comfortable to give credit. And that is what our model has assured. So all the other things, all the other slides are talking about the various stages. We can go further down. We can go for, we can go further down. Okay, here, yeah, 26. Okay, so we're not just interested in uh, we're not just interested in crop. We also do a lot with uh, livestock. This is a model that we have uh, developed, and the proof of concept has currently been concluded. It's uh, an integrated commercial livestock development project and a service center. This in this breeding center, you are aware that we have a lot of issues between uh, we have a. Uh, headers and farmers clashes often. So this is a model that has been developed to contain the headers and the farmers issues. Is synonymous to ranches that you have, but in these places you have business, uh, you have business segments that are headed by, we've considered the women and children to be captured where they, where they, where they rear the, where they breed and also do the milking and process milk into yogurt for now. We have the young men who do the fodder and uh, grass supply. And then you have the, pair, the fathers who operate the feedlot. And then there's an auction arena, there's a barbecue, and then meat is sold in the market. This model as, uh, as developed currently has produced two sets of uh, fattened the uh, bulls. The heifers that they produce are still there. And then we're looking at artificial insemination now to improve the breed that we have in that place so that we can have better, higher milk uh, yielding uh, breeds and then beef uh, meat uh, breeds. Can we go further down? I think I should be close to the end. Okay, here, 32, 32, 32, slide number 32, yes. So this is what we call the holy grail of our structure. What this speaks to, starting from the uh, horizontal lines, you can see all the services that we we'll call them the baseline investment services. So we've been able to design a baseline investment services that allows investors in agriculture and in agribusiness in Nigeria to pick an area where they are interested in investing. You have the smallholder based commercial agricultural sites and services. You have the captive off-grid energy service. You have the NISA climate smart irrigation program. You have our land preparation 
and the seed processing, and then you have our primary production. And then the vertical tells you the commodities that have, that these are the commodities that the country spends a lot of money in imports. So these commodities will actually sit on any of these prepared land with irrigation, with climate smart uh, irrigation, if we need that, with the land preparation and seed processes and fits into a value added processing and then back into the market. So this is this sums up all that we do in NISA in one fell in one in one swoop. I'm conscious of time. I think we can just go close to the last page because most of the important things that we do is what I've just described. And uh, but basically, like I said, our intention is to not just to catalyze finance that will not return, but to make sure. Let's look at thirty eight but to make sure that we bring in people into agriculture, they make investments and then they make their money back. This speaks to our field structure, just like you have extension services. The NISA, our nationwide project monitoring, reporting and remediation office, which is capacitated with full technology and mobility to give us in some cases and in some fields, we have online real-time reporting where we have probes that gives us, you know, sends information back to us. We have uh, partnerships with uh, Microsoft and then we also have partnership with uh, MasterCard to transmit information from the field back to a monitoring center in the head office. This allows us to have online real-time information. But I think one thing you should know is the fact that we have designed and developed two bespoke insurance products that are peculiar to Nigeria as part of uh, safeguarding investments in agriculture. One is the area yield index insurance, and the second is the multi peril crop index insurance, which we've designed. And both insurance products are uh, reinsured by Swissry. Treasury is, our, is the reinsurance company that works with us. Prior to this time, only one insurance company, the government insurance company, Naik, was insuring agri uh, investments in Nigeria. But as of today, we have 11 other insurance, private insurance companies, which will have helped uh, get certification from the National Insurance Commission to uh, underwrite insurance, agricultural insurance in Nigeria, and all their products are reinsured by Swiss Re or African Re. I think that's uh, the high point of what our achievements have been so far in driving agriculture. Uh, NISAL, uh, I think in the last pages, you will also see that we have set up an equivalent of NISAL in conjunction with uh, the Chobolese government. They call, it's called MIFA, I don't speak French, sorry. It's called MIFA in Togo in their own language, and they are already functional. And we're in talks with a few other African countries in setting up equivalent of NISA, especially when it has to do with uh, facilitating finance to agribusiness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Izzy, for a very interesting presentation, bringing into the discussion the role of the financial sector and the financial constraints on the agricultural sector. Um, I think this is going to take us to the third uh, uh, speaker uh, that we have tonight with us. Um, our third speaker, Dr. Aike, is an economist. Uh, he's currently the head of Department of Accounting, Finance and Economics at the Lagos Business School and he's also the program director of the Lagos Business School Agribusiness Program. Uh, in addition to his teaching, Dr. Aike also engages in consulting services that have included assignments with the World Bank, with the, with the UNIDO and with other international institutions. Uh, Dr. Aiki is going to shed the light on some kind of comparison between Nigeria and Egypt with some aspects related to the agribusiness uh, sector. Uh, Dr. Aiki, would you like to start? So good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I, like um, rightly said, I am a faculty member of the business school where I teach agribusiness and also teach economics. 
So I'm going to look at, break down what some of the things that um, Eze has shared, bringing it down to, so I'm a classroom teacher, so I'm going to break it down for you to see some of the narrative in terms of the agribusiness. So can I share my slides now? Or can you share it? Okay, I can share it from here. So the, the uniqueness of what I do in the business school is that we started a program six years ago called the Lagos Business Agribusiness Program. And that, that program sits on a tripod. Interestingly, we were looking at a sector that was 80% smallholder farmers, like as they said, and 20% corporate farmers. So the corporate farmers are not enough to actually boost the agricultural sector in Nigeria. So we started a program that sits on a tripod and the first tripod speaks to critical thinking and understanding the agri-value chain where we assumed and presumed that there was so much losses taking place in the agricultural sector. So a lot of people were going into this space without truly understanding the scientific nature of the agricultural sector. So the first thing we do is to bring them on speed by actually looking at critical thinking and understanding the agribusiness value chain. So we take them through the various value chains. Some of the things that AZ has um, put in different compartments that the NYSHA actually does. So the second model speaks to entrepreneurial mindsets. One of the things he said was the difficulty of banks to finance smallholder farmers because they lack organizational structure, they lack governance structure, they don't keep their financial record, they don't uh, keep their books, they do business in an unstructured way. So the, the second of my tripod looks at entrepreneurial mindset, where we begin to train and equip these farmers in terms of understanding, keeping record and taking agriculture as a business and not as a pleasure um, uh, activities. The third of the tripod is operational excellence. When we look at Africa as producing things that cannot stand, that are not competitive at the global space. So we say for you to actually produce, you must be able to sell whatever you produce, to package, to brand, and to produce quality items, quality produce that can actually compete at the big league stage. So this is essentially what I do at the business school. And we've been successful starting up business, business enterprise that are now doing so well in the sector. So I'm going to speak to agribusiness generally to look at the ecosystem and to look at some of the relationship between Egypt and Nigeria. So the agribusiness ecosystem is actually a combination of agriculture and ag agribusiness activities. We all know that agriculture simply means direct farming. Farming in terms of farming of livestock production, farming in terms of fishery, and farming in terms of forestry. Now, the agribusiness sector is a combination of agriculture and business. Now, what you find, what you find in terms of the small, if you look at Egypt, you find out that one farmer can barely, I think I looked at the statistics, you're looking at almost less than an acre for one to one farmer. So again, when you look at Nigeria, it's so difficult to predict the land size of the average smallholder farmer. So agribusiness is about a combination of agriculture and business. It involves an integrated system that links the entire agricultural ecosystem from farm to fork, where we look at how do we move the distribution network, the logistics network, the marketing network, the packaging network, moving all of this from one stage, which is the beginning of the product, down to the producers. So the agricultural sector is currently one of the most important sector in the African economy. The sector is so important because it has a direct linkage to meeting the basic needs of man. So we talk about food, we talk about housing, we talk about cloth, clothing, and we talk about wellness, especially when you look at medicine. It employs the most people in the developing an emerging economy, and is the main source of food and income for many people living under poverty. It is the largest sector contributing to 
to the most to most to the African economy. It is the largest employer of labor and has a direct. We saw what our professor there, the last his last slide when you looked at the 17 um, SDG goals. Agriculture is actually linked to the 17 SDG goals. The agricultural sector and agribusiness sector is a unique sector to both the Nigerian economy and the Egyptian economy. So we look at the narrative. We look at the two economy as both economies are considered as middle income and emerging economy. When you look at the population, when you look at the size of the economy, you have three in the neighborhood of three seventy billion dollars. Whilst you're looking at four, almost four fifty billion dollars in terms of nominal GDP. When you look at the per capita income, you see that both countries are almost at the same range. However, the Egyptian um, uh, per capita income, the income per head, is relatively higher than the Nigerian per capita income. When you look at the sectors. So one unique features of the agricultural sector is that when you categorize the sectors in terms of agriculture, industry, and service, both countries are clearly similar in terms of the activities at the, ser the service sector, where Egypt currently boasts about 54% of the economy operating within the service sector, whilst Nigeria is 54.4%. However, when in, you look at it in terms of agriculture, agriculture takes about 11.7% in terms of uh, the sector distribution. Whilst for Nigeria, it takes about 21.9%. Industrial activity is low in Nigeria, while industrial activity is higher in Egypt. When you look at in terms of employment, employment in the agricultural sector as a percentage of total employment, you find Nigeria doing about 35%, whilst Egypt is doing about 23.3%. In terms of the labor force, you have 32 million, you have 90.5 million. Again, when you look at the narrative of the total number that, are, that is employed, I will share that in my next slide. When you look at the kind of produce, what you find in both countries, you find date palm, fig tree, eggplant, strawberries, tomato, watermelon, cotton, rice, wheat, sugar cane, sugar beets. So I, I didn't bring in the aquaculture here. I didn't bring in the, the livestock sector here. And I also didn't bring in the fishery. These are sectors that are both common to Nigeria and um, Egypt. However, when you look at the major agricultural exports, one of the things that boosts the foreign exchange of the country is your exports, the quality of your exports. When you look at the major agricultural exports, you'll see commodity crops such as potato, cotton, fresh fruits, primary citrus. When you look at the major exports, the major export of Nigeria, there are three items that stand out. We have about five, but there are three major items that stand out. Sesame, cotton, and cashew. If you're conversant with Nigeria in the 60s and 70s, in the 60s and 70s, Nigeria was known for palm oil. Nigeria was known for rubber. Nigeria was known for also known for groundnut exports. Nigeria was known for such commodity exports in the 60s and in the 70s. However, today all that dynamics has changed. So these are the major crops. And again, when you look at what we export, we export them in their raw states. We actually don't add value in terms of the value added, which um, Professor Adele talked about, where he talked about sustain, sustainable, sustainable agriculture, where you begin to add and stretch the value chain. Now, in terms of major agricultural imports, both countries are known to export cereal, corn, and wheat. wheat uh, for Nigeria, you have wheat and you have cereal, and you also have corn, corn, maize for Nigeria. This year, we had a scenario where the government um, came, up with, uh, came up with a harsh policy that stopped the importation of um, 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 maize and farmers cried out and government actually re relaxed by allowing multinational companies to bring in maize into the country. Same thing with cereal, with wheat. 
Nigeria is actually not competitive in the production of wheat. When you look at our yield per hectare, it is actually compared to the value, the, the, the total need of the country, and compared to what we produce, we're actually not competitive in the production of just like Egypt um, imports um, wheat. Now, in terms of agricultural sector contributes about 25% to the Nigerian uh, GDP. Although when you look at the growth of the sector, especially when you look at what is shared, when you look at those beautiful policies that, uh, that NISRA government has carried out, government has done a lot in terms of boosting the agricultural sector. However, when you look at the growth of the sector, it actually does not correlate with the beautiful slide that uh, my brother is a shared. It doesn't correlate because the sector is one of the least um, performing sector in Nigeria today, currently growing at 1.5%. Um, it's, it's not listed among the fastest growing sector. However, in terms of contribution to GDP, it is the topmost sector contributing to Nigerians' GDP. Agriculture is one of the most dominant sector of the Egyptian economy, just like Nigeria. The country takes the sector seriously because of the limited arable land and water resource. The share of labor force. So this is where the narrative has to change. The share which is they talked about, that the policy drive of the government is to allow smallholder farmers a space in the production cycle of most of the commodities that we produce in the country. So if you look at the share of labor force employed in the agricultural sector, this is where we begin to speak to agribusiness and move gradually away from agriculture. You, you discover that for Nigeria and Egypt, the, the relative share of the labor force in the sector is 37% and 32% respectively. Now compare, compare the numbers with United Kingdom, with United States of America. If you look at the width that is imported into, into um, um, Egypt, almost 80% of that width comes from America, comes from the United States of America. Now, if you look at that, the country that, that sends width to Egypt, look at the number of people, look, looking at their labor force, the share of the labor force employed in the agricultural, in the agricultural sector, it is 1.3% of their total labor force. If you look at Canada, it is 1.4%. If you look at France, it is 2.4%. If you look at South Africa, it is 4.9%. Netherlands, 5 points. Now, coming down to Egypt, you're seeing 23.28%. China, 24%. Nigeria, 34.7%. India, 41.5%. Now, what this data shows is that there is a positive correlation between countries that are advanced in agrotech, countries that are, are currently adapting to digital technology in agriculture, information technology in agriculture, companies that are entering into biotechnology in agriculture, companies that are, that are actually using latest technology, drone technology, the artificial intelligence in agriculture, you find out that all these countries require fewer number of people to actually produce more. So this is an era where we should begin to think through how do we integrate technology? How do we integrate knowledge? The more knowledgeable a country is, the fewer the number of players that you find in the agricultural sector, and the more will be the, the number in terms of the productivity of the product that that country goes into. So this data speaks volume. It tells us that we are not doing so much in terms of mechanizing the agricultural sector. We are not doing so much in terms of moving towards artificial intelligence, with which our prof shared earlier. So over 40% of Egyptian import are food and agricultural products with wheat and corn dominating annually. Nigeria, like Egypt, imports wheat and corn annually. The dominant news coming from Africa is that Africa has a capacity to feed the world through the proceeds from her agriculture if she embraces the value added approach. The call for increased move away from the traditional subsistence. So each time we talk about subsistence agriculture, we're saying, how can we move away from the smallholder farmer that can barely aggregate one acre farmland? I'm not talking of hectare, one acre farmland. One acre farmland by Nigerian's definition is a four plots of land. And we're not looking at yield per plot of land. We're actually looking at yield per hectare 
not yield per hectare. We are looking at tons, tonnage per hectare, not tonnage per acre. So what you find is that you have over 80% of our entire, over 80% of those engaged in the sector are smallholder farmers, and they, they barely aggregate land. They do not have the land to produce the quantity. So this is similar to Egypt, where you have a concentration of small players within the agricultural sector. For example, when you look at Cote d'Ivoire, Cote d'Ivoire, for example, is the leading world producer of cocoa. But the country appropriates very little in terms of the income from cocoa value chain. This explanation, this explains, the explanation of this lies in understanding the agribusiness agri value chain. So why is, why is Cote d'Ivoire producing so much, yet appropriating so little in the cocoa value chain? Because they are engaging in pure agriculture. They have actually not, not integrated properly into the value added approach which is embracing the agribusiness agri approach. So when you look at the data, Cote d'Ivoire produces 1.9 million metric tons with, a, with an average yield in terms of ton per hectare of 0.49. So you find Ghana doing better than Cote d'Ivoire in terms of yield, but because of their geographical location and their spread, Cote d'Ivoire actually does more in terms of production. So look at Nigeria in the hierarchy. So the question is, the countries, only appropriate only about 30% of the cocoa value chain. While Switzerland, a country that does not grow cocoa, takes over 70% of the income from the cocoa value chain. So if you put Switzerland into the equation, they don't grow cocoa, but yet because they are, they are engaged in technology, they are engaged in the agribusiness space, they are engaged in chocolates, in value added chocolate space. They are able to appropriate the wealth that comes from, from Africa, that comes from, 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 from Cote d'Ivoire. So we begin to think, is there a way that Africa can begin to move away gradually from traditional, traditional agricultural practice to begin to move into indigenous industrial agricultural practice? So we need to understand this. AZ spoke to this, but I'm going to break, break it down so when he was looking at the value chain. So I'm breaking it down so that we understand where to situate some of the things that we do in Egypt. So, Agriculture is agribusiness value chain because of the uniqueness of the word agribusiness is divided and separated into four, four sectors, pre-upstream, upstream, midstream, and the downstream sector. Now the upstream sector deals basically with research institution, seed and land management, and the management and control of pests and diseases. You hardly can find the smallholder player play in the pre-upstream space. It requires significant sunk costs, it requires deep pocket, it requires heavy investment for you to go into that space. The upstream, this is the beginning of the value chain. And here we're looking at direct farming, crop, crop cultivation across the crop, livestock, forestry, and fishery sector. The midstream, this is the, 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 the sector where we look at manufacturing, processing, packaging, tool fabrication, design, sales, logistics, marketing, and, and so many other sector that cuts across with input, adding value to the produce that comes from the upstream sector, the downstream sector. This again requires, looks at the distribution, logistics, exports, or the value added products. Again, within the downstream space, we look at imports, import of equipment, import of, of tractors, imports of preservative, imports of chemicals and fertilizers, falls within the downstream value chain. Now the activities, in this ag agribusiness value chain are broadly. So if we look at it critically, this is where we begin to ask those questions. How do we, how do we engage our youths within the agri-value chain? How do we uh, engage our youths? How do we engage our multinational corporation? Where does government role end and where does government role begin? So if we take the pre-upstream, we're looking at research institutions, the various research institutions. So we, we situate our universities a university of agriculture within the pre upstream where you begin to develop the mindset to engage in proper and good agronomy practice. So you have land management, you have irrigation. Land management is big in Egypt. Irrigation activity is also big in Egypt because you're looking at a land mass that is, built, that is practically a desert. So you have pest and disease management, you have forestry management, infrastructure development, quality control, within the agri space, looking at what we produce, quality testing, education, all this falls within the 
pre upstream. So if you look at what AZ shared, they actually situated them in the context of the bank, the, the, the NISRA, what NISRA is doing. So I'm breaking it down further for you to understand where to situate them. Active participants within this value chain, you have the government. The government plays a key role within the research institution. You have the multinational firms. You have the Greek institutions, the research institutions, the non-governmental organization, development banks. This is where they find. So if you're going to throw NISRA into this whole picture, you actually begin to throw NISRA into the activities they perform within the pre-upstream uh, value chain. The upstream value chain, this is direct farming. And we situate it in the crop production cycle, in the livestock cycle, in the fishery cycle, and the forestry cycle. The activities here is that we have what? Micro, small, and medium scale farmers. They are over 80%, similar to what we find in Nigeria, over 80% of small holder farmers. You also have large corporate farms. Here they are actually, they are actually 20% in, in Nigeria. Again, AZ talked about farmers. In terms of employment opportunities, this is where you find largely women and youth. You find women and youth within the upstream value chain engaged in small agricultural practice. So if we can begin to harness them within this space, then you look at the midstream value chain. Here we have logistics, we have trade association, we have distribution and fabrication, sales and marketing, agro journalism, com commodity exchange, which is a talked about that currently we do not have a commodity exchange. We are beginning to have, we have one currently, but they are still in the process of their formation stage. Packaging, branding, storage, and fabrication. Who are the active participants? Value, this is the value added space. You have multiple middlemen and women actively participating within the midstream value chain. In most cases, they distort the pricing of agricultural products in Nigeria. Highly fragmented, the sector is also highly fragmented where you have marketing sales, trading activities, fabrication services, falls within this space. Again, this is where you have, you, you easily have young, young players go into the sector. Young players are actually found within the midstream value chain where they add, they add one or two things and they move it to the next um, level. The downstream sector, this again has to do with export and import, the shipping activities. So activities here are, are basically activity participants are large multinational corporations, government and financial institutions. You also find the likes of Mishra playing, playing a cross board within the upstream because they fund at each stage, they fund at each stage of the value chain. Now, the interesting thing is that if you're following using the smallholder farmer model, you cannot situate them in the pre-upstream value chain. You also cannot situate them in the downstream value chain. You also do not want them to be scattered alongside the upstream value chain. We want to push more of the 80% the, the, the smallholder farmer to the distribution, to the midstream value chain. Whilst we need large commercial farms to play within the act, as active participants in the upstream value chain. So it, it's been said repeatedly that agriculture holds the key to unlocking the African economy. However, the truth remains that it is investment in agribusiness and not agriculture that holds the key to unlocking the African economy. The reality is that agriculture as a sector is prone to challenges beyond the smallholder um, farmer. And some of these challenges were, they were actually shared by Professor Adele, where, Adele, where he talked about the, where he talked about climate change, how climate change is changing the narrative in the agricultural sector. The sector is prone to adverse weather condition, soil salinity, which is very prone to farmers in Egypt. Climate change, irrigation challenges, knowledge upgrade on the part of farmers. So one important thing about the sector is that the agricultural has to know that the, the, the practice of agriculture is made up of or structured in such a way that it is 70% science, 20% experiential learning, and 10% arts. The art part is the passion part. Interestingly, most of the 80% smallholder farmers and some of the 20% um, uh, middle income farmers that you find within this space actually enter, they enter the sector 
discounting the 70% science, discounting the 20% science, and actually driven by the 10% art. So they say, I am in love with farming. My parents taught me farming. So they take that and they jump into this space, forgetting that agriculture is actually a science-based thing. It is, it is scientific, highly scientific. It also requires hand-holding. Somebody must have put you through before you can do well with it. It's either you learn by, by default, by making mistake. So most active participants enter the sector by taking only the 10% acts, the passion part of agriculture. The passion part is dominated by physical strength and the traditional mindsets. Here we look at subsistence farming, which is where we are moving away from. It is devoid of the scientific and the experiential learning. This explains the high failure rates and low productivity experience in the agricultural sector in Africa. The missing link, which uh, Professor Adele actually talked about it. The missing link, therefore, is investment in human capital, investment in education, investment in training, investment in manpower development, and exposure of young farmers to smart technology. They actually cleared it, including if Africa must feed herself and contribute to, to meeting the 2030 sustainable development goals of ending poverty and hunger, responding to climate change, and sustaining our natural resource. Emphasis must shift from the current approach of focusing on direct farming activity to embracing the value added approach in agriculture. So this entails significant increase in knowledge and awareness of agriculture, the robustness of agriculture and agribusiness sector through embracing of smart and innovative um, farming. Some of those things that Professor Abdul shared are the, the smart technology, the artificial intelligence we're talking about. Government, research institutions, corporate multinational organizations, and citizens all have a role to play in moving the agricultural sector forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Aiki, for the very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, I really like the focus or the, the way that you ended your presentation by highlighting again what uh, Dr. Aiden was speaking about and the role of technologies and the role of investing in human capital. If we really want to get over all uh, the, 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 the barriers or to, to allow or to increase the competitiveness of the sector for Africa. Um, actually, I'm I, I've received a lot of interesting questions uh, in the chat box. And uh, what I'm going to do for the sake of time and not to take too long from everyone's time is um, I will pose one question. Um, I will pose one question to each uh, speaker that has been collected from the questions um, uh, in, the, in the chat box by the participants. And uh, actually, given that uh, Mr. Ezi is actually facing some technical difficulties, uh, I will start with him because we might lose him in the conversation anytime, uh, given the struggle that he's going with uh, on the road. Uh, Mr. Ezi, are you still with us? Okay, I think we, um, we already lost connection with uh, Mr. Izzy. So let me now start we with lost uh, Dr. Aydel then. Yes, so let me start with uh, Dr. Aydel. Uh, lots of questions actually came about uh, how the, the size of the agricultural land in Egypt is decreasing and how can we overcome uh, this issue? So how, how do you think this issue is going to affect the agricultural product of Egypt? And how should this feature into uh, an agricultural strategy? How, how what, and another uh, question when it comes to how this yeah, decline yeah. In, in the size of the agricultural sector that is mainly dominated or is mainly uh, due to the expansion of the real estate sector, so the devotion of land to real estate sector, how is this affecting um, how is this affecting the agricultural products in Egypt? How is government strategies taking this into consideration? And how can Egypt eventually, given this uh, barrier or given this issue, how can Egypt uh, eventually uh, start growing its own products and and stop the reliance on importing many of the essential products like wheat, for example? Um, I can, 
the last segment, Hadritic, uh, I missed hearing it. Um, Dr. Dina, I mean, I heard some segments. Let me tell you what I heard very quickly. You are talking about the uh, declining uh, uh, size of uh, of the uh, parcels of land and so on. You are talking about uh, and what we are going to do about it. And then you talked about um, the uh, how we can have self-sufficiency in major cereals such as wheat. This is what you talked about. What yes. what else? But you started with something I didn't hear. What was the first element? It was the government strategy and how the government strategy is taking this decline in the size of the land while having a strategy for the agricultural sector. Okay. Um, okay. It, you would like me to address this now? Huh? Uh, the, let, me, let me start with yes. the issue of the land. Uh, the land size is shrinking according to the law of inheritance. This is one aspect and uh, to non-economical parcels, which really in the Delta, um, now we have about 8.6 uh, million acres uh, of, 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 for farming and um, by intensification, which is 188%, uh, we are moving to 200. You could multiply this, but the issue here is that the delta land, the old fertile land, is really decaying because they, there is urban, there is buildings and urban uh, planning on this land, which is uh, we have tried in the in the strategy. We put a, a very severe um, legislation, which really even confiscate the land from the person who took this land which was for agriculture and then he put buildings onto it and therefore it will be legally you change the purpose for the national interest if you if you continue doing this the land will be taken and then it will be converted to agricultural land this is the only way we do this but meanwhile the government should really plan vertically we had to have a massive planning for the first thousand villages whereby very innovative ideas uh, how to can to build vertically and let the the sons and the, the growing families really stay without really making any infringes on their habits culture or anything and this if you get even young young engineers they can design some innovative ideas in a competition and we can go through this program which will balance uh, this issue. Meanwhile, we are expanding in the desert. We had at least 2 million acres which was expanded, but the same thing which happened in the, in the new land, there is now new, new land, a new old land. And this, the same uh, tragedy which happened by expanding and building will happen to it we need to apply the law. We had a unit which was established by a national committee for land use. And this uh, was from experts from all the universities in Egypt. And, uh, and, and this was monitoring by satellite every six months. Even a hut in, in the Russell Bar could be accounted for. But this has to have implementation through the local government. And this is, it's a matter of legislation, in addition, respecting the people and try to do something for them. Both of them go together. About self-sufficiency, Egypt should go in a balance. We have to have what I call economical self-sufficiency. Then the total, um, the total sum of the food which you transfer to monetary term, which you need, you have to balance it between exporting uh, uh, up till now, um, we, we uh, of course, we are exporting um, fresh and uh, processed food with about $4 billion, even more than $4 billion. Uh, um, a colleague, Tariq Tawfiq, could really give you the latest information. But, but the issue here is that you have to balance between 
this return, economical return, which is coming from a very small size of land and the issue of self-sufficiency. You don't have to have full self-sufficiency. If it is not for, I mean, if we didn't do any research in having um, new uh, varieties in wheat and in maize and uh, try all the time to increase productivity, we should have been by now um, minus, I mean, we, we import more than 60 or 70%, but actually it's less than that. It's of course about 55%. We need to minimize this gap, but to minimize it based on knowledge, based on new varieties and new agro-management techniques, which will optimize the water use. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aydel. And uh, actually, you've, you've been touching on the question that I was actually going to pose at Dr. Aike as well. So thinking of these, um, of the role of the of the technology and the, and the use of technology and having this as a tool in order to overcome uh, barriers or to actually achieve a sustainable sector, Dr. Aiki, in your uh, in your opinion, do you think or or what do you think about the role of the government versus the role of the private sector when we come to talk about the use of the new technology or the new tools in agri business? So I will actually want to even address the first question you asked before talking about the role of the government and the role of the private sector. Now, if you look at a country like um, Netherlands, Netherlands is the leading country exporting horticulture and flowers, exporting flowers to the world, to China, to US. Now, when you look at Netherlands, like Egypt, Egypt has land problem and salinity of the land. Netherlands is literally underwater. The land is not suitable for agriculture. But yet, Netherlands, with the embracement of technology, the greenhouse technology, good agronomy practice, they've been able to do what? Move away from the oil and gas sector. And they are the leading country exporting seed, exporting agrotech to the world economy today. And that has boosted the country's um, revenue. Just like um, Professor Abdes talked about, Egypt can actually leverage on technology. But again, technology takes time. We need the, the various institutions, the educational institutions, to begin to prepare the young people for the next generation of farmers. The next generation of farmers are not smallholder farmers. The next generation of farmers are private equity firms. They're going to invest large capital in the agricultural space. We are going to embrace artificial, artificial intelligence, robotic engineering within the agricultural space. There you will no longer be talking about land because land is no longer a constraint because we now have cases where people farm on houses. They now do their farms on greenhouse technology, not necessarily. We have hydroponics, we have aeroponics. We have all kinds of technology within the, that defiles the issue of land and weather because you can now do what control the weather and everything within the agro space. So the second question that you asked, which links the private sector, there's a role for the government. The entire ecosystem cannot support itself. If you look at the US, the United States of America still subsidizes farmers. Where you have bad weather conditions, cyclones, they still subsidize farmers. Government has a role to play in terms of subsidizing some sectors. I'll give us an example. If you go into tree cropping and you go into setting fruits in Egypt, it actually takes years for you to harvest those crops. No private sector will want to plant today and wait for eight, 10 years before they harvest. So there's usually no incentive to plant those kind of crops, but government can encourage the sector. Government can encourage by giving seeds, by funding the planting of some of these crops, which will actually build further the ecosystem. The private sector, again, I said, has a role to play. The educational institutions have a role to play. The research institutions also have a role to be play. There must be a blend within all of this um, group to boost the agricultural ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aiki. And actually, 
uh, one of the questions that I had for uh, Mr. Izzy was uh, was related to this very last statement of yours, so I will actually uh, have it for you as well. So one of the questions that came was saying, uh, creating loans to the young graduate and having financial uh, aids or financial um, uh, support to young graduates, especially or to invest in agriculture and livestock. Do you think this in itself could actually boost the agribusiness or the agricultural sector in Africa? So what we found and what so I share, what I share in my so so what I share in my agribusiness class is that money is the least of your worry. As a young graduate, money is the least of your worry. Knowledge and information should be your concern. So I was part of um, the IITA, IITA in um, Ibadan in Nigeria. Yeah. Actually, started the Young Agripreneur Program, where they funded. They kept these young people for two years. They prepared and trained them, and they funded their business. We, they actually pitched their agri business, and they funded their business with 20, 25 to thirty thousand dollars. That's what they gave each of these farmers. We also took this initiative to Kenya. The same IITA took the initiative to Kenya, where the ADB, African Development Bank, funded these young people who are in different areas of the agri value chain. They were given between $25,000 and $30,000. The success rate was between 5 and 10% between Nigeria and Kenya, meaning that the youths waited for us to give them that fund. As soon as those funds got into their hands, they diverted it into other things. So in the long term, <laughs> they moved it to other things. So for me, what I say in class is we need passionate people we need to catch them very young. We need to start at the preschool level to get people to encourage young people to go into agriculture. We need to prepare their mindset. We need to train them. So it is not just about being passionate. We need to we need to equip them with the right technology, the right information, the right give them land because land is a big problem, or give them facility, encourage not give them money, give them everything that they need, and put a little cash flow to start the business. So what we did in IIT was to give them all the money and they turned the money into other ventures. Thank you. So in other words, you're actually nurturing the 10% of art or passion in this first, and then you, you get into the 20 and the 70% of the tools, technology and mastering uh, yes. the skills and mastering the managerial skills to actually allow them to succeed in that. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Aiki, for this. Um, Dr. Aidel actually wanted to share with us um, uh, uh, one final point before we can uh, we can end this very interesting webinar. Dr. Aidel, please. Yes, it's it's, it's a matter of the the question you asked about the graduate is very important. It's uh, it's uh, how how you can get the the young generation. Uh, really get involved into a productive work rather than being alienated. I mean, a citizen in a country, either he will be affiliated or totally alienated. And this alienation could cause the country a havoc because this is, he can be a source of socio-political upheaval later. And therefore we need to contain him in, but he, he has to have dignity. He has to uh, have the buy-in with, which uh, uh, Professor Ike is uh, speaking about. The, he has to work with passion and all these elements has to be embedded in a framework, an institutional framework. We tried to change the law of the cooperative and we did. I mean, the law of the cooperative now in Egypt permit that this young people can get together, they form a cooperative and they take a parcel of land and they really had an agri-business, agro-industry. In this piece of land, they can go to a bank and they can have credit from the bank. And we encourage this. I mean, several banks was interested in this, the National Bank of Egypt and the Agricultural Bank and others and so on. I don't want to really elaborate on this, but you need to give them the stairs of hope for new horizon, rather than the tail of a snake to come down, like the snakes and ladder, in, in, um, when people were young who are 
now I see them in the screen. <laughs> uh, some of them young, some is not so young. Anyhow, let me go to this slide, which I wanted uh, at the end, which is, I, I just gone through it very quickly. We need a dynamic shift, uh, which, which is really required. We need to change the business model of the agribusiness because of the changing environment. I talked about climate change and um, uh, issues like uh, COVID-19 and, and the others, which will affect transport, it will affect uh, collections, it will affect income, it will affect the supplies, the, 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 the inputs of agriculture and the outputs, most of them. Therefore, we need to think of how we can make this agribusiness a dynamic business, not a static. You need to assess the situation, you need to plan ahead, and always with short, short plan. That's why you have to shift, you need to have a shift in the supply chain, dynamic, creative, and innovative new system, enable, uh, enabling environment like legislation, new institution, private sector, NGO societies, trade regulations, and the quarantine has to be liberated uh, with preserving the safety, intensification agricultural production, like vertical agriculture, which we mentioned, ensuring quality and safety uh, from the field to the fork. And we have now an organization in Egypt, which is concerned only by food safety, which is very good. We need to have a new horizon for the agro-processing technology, it has to be AI driven, modernization here, economical wise as well, it really, you, you, you use less income, less invest in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, investment uh, for a very productive units. Changing consumer, you have to change according to the changing consumer demand, risk aversion and risk management, including safety nets like insurance, which I mentioned before. As well, you have to go uh, for a short and quick uh, supply uh, for instance, and people who will go directly and, and sell the product from the field rather than uh, going through intermediate. We had a major program when I was uh, chair of the Global Forum for Agricultural Research. We had a global program in Africa and Asia, and as well as in Latin America called Linking Farmer uh, to Market. And in this, really, we had gathered uh, international banks and local banks and regional banks with farmer organization, and we tried really to enhance the link between the farmer and the market uh, in a very profitable way, minimize the intermediate people who really take the creme de la creme of the whole operation. I will stop here and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aydil, and I'm actually glad we're actually ending this very interesting, interesting discussion on a very positive note, which is looking at the agricultural sector not from a static point of view and how dynamic shifts are actually required in, in order to bring this sector to really move forward. Dr. Aiki, one last question for you, and, and I promise we're going to end it uh, at that. Uh, if, if cooperation is to happen between different countries on uh, on agribusiness sector, what is or what grounds of cooperation do you see happening? So, for example, having this very interesting comparison between Egypt and Nigeria in your uh, presentation, what room of cooperation could you see happening between different countries in the continent on uh, the ground of agribusiness? So, so I'll give you an example where Africa can actually trade. Nigeria, Nigeria shot her border. Nigeria, Nigerian government came up with um, a trade restriction policy four years ago, where they restricted the importation of rice into the country. As at the time that policy came on board, a bag of 50 kg rice was about $50. Now they shut their borders and pumped in a lot of money through the Anchor Bolas program they gave out loans to farmers to go into production of rice, that the country is self-sustainable in the production of rice. The interesting thing that happened is that they didn't look at the, the, they didn't look at the competitiveness of Nigeria in rice production. They actually did not look at the numbers, that Nigeria does not sit very well in terms of rice, rice cultivation and rice. Our yield is so low 
even with your good agronomy practice, our yield is low. Our yield is 2.2 tons per hectare. So you're comparing Nigeria's yield of 2.2 tons per hectare to a country like China that is doing close to eight metric tons per hectare. So it pays Nigeria to produce those commodities in which they have competitive advantage and export those and export it to countries where countries that have what do not have competitive advantage in those um, uh, products. So Africa can actually trade with Africa if only we can sit back and look at those crops. For example, Egypt has their top, top five crops where they are actually number one, number two, and number three in terms of competitiveness across the globe. If Egypt were to compete with Nigeria, Egypt would probably be doing straw strawberry and selling to Nigeria. Nigeria can actually, Nigeria is competitive in the production of maize. However, Nigeria has not deepened her production cycle in terms of maize. If Nigeria can actually produce high quality maize, Nigeria can actually export maize to Egypt. Whilst Egypt can export certain fruits that are not cultivated. If you look at your milk, Egypt actually produces milk in commercial quantity. I think they're number three in the world. This is your bull milk. Egypt can actually export these things to Nigeria, whilst Nigeria will export those commodities in which we have competitive advantage. Again, we need to, players, investors need to begin to look at what are those crops that we can produce with very minimal technology. We can do more by producing those club, uh, crops because of factor endowments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beck, and thank you, Dr. Idel, for the very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to thank you all and apologize for actually keeping you longer than the expected time. Uh, I just want to say that uh, recordings of this webinar is going to be shared with, the, with all the participants for, uh, for the many people who are asking about the, the slides and the recordings. It will be shared with all the participants. And again, uh, thank you all very much for attending the webinar and thank you Dr. Ike and Dr. Idel for the very uh, wealth of knowledge of the, and the, the, the very interesting presentations. And thank uh, good you. night to thank everyone. Thank you Dr. Vina for an able moderation. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Thank you. And have a blessed night. I wish everything will go all right in Lagos. <laughs> Lagos is Lagos is in crisis. Yes, I have seen in the computer now. It's a, it's, it's yeah. terrible. They are killing youths. They are killing the young people. Soldiers yeah, are in the streets. And burning and looting everywhere. Yes, yes. Lagos this, is in. This is what we are afraid from. When young people does not have decent life, this is what yes, they do. Yes, no, no social safety nets. Yeah, we have we, we have an army of unemployed youths with yeah. burst of energy. Yeah, we just hope hope things will change. We hope and and we have to work for it. Yeah, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all. Uh, okay. Good, goodbye.